So now that we've got a good broad overview of what the menstrual cycle consists of in terms of its components, let's break down each of those components and the specific phases of those components as we move forward. So we're going to entitle the next flowchart ovarian cycle 1. And here what we're going to be looking at more specifically is the first part of the ovarian cycle, which would be the follicular phase. So let's entitle or subtitle this follicular phase. And let's remember this is occurring from days 1 through 13. So what's going to be happening here? It's always good to start off at the top, and that's going to be literally and figuratively because we're starting at the hypothalamus the brain structure that's going to be really in charge of guiding this whole process. Because remember, the female reproductive sort of uh, system and the female reproductive control is all going to be focused and surrounded upon hormonal regulation, much like everything in the body. So it's important to start at this primary hormonal structure of the hypothalamus. What's the hormone associated with the hypothalamus? It's always going to be GNRH, gonadotropic releasing hormone. That always goes to what? That goes to the anterior pituitary. Once it goes to the anterior pituitary, it sends a message to the anterior pituitary to do the following. The anterior pituitary must then release FSH, follicle-stimulating hormone, and also the hormone LH, both hand in hand. These are tropic hormones. They're supposed to go to the gonads, and specifically in females, this will be to the ovaries. But the FSH hormone, let's say a little bit more specifically what it does. Its job is to stimulate follicle growth, much like its name says so. Stimulates follicle growth. Let me rewrite that. Stimulates follicle growth. Follicle stimulating hormone for that reason. Luteinizing hormone does much the same. We're just going to state that it also does that. We'll say it aids follicle growth as well. So it tells you a lot about how important it is for this follicle that we mentioned before that contains the primary oocyte, that contains follicle cells, that contains that zona pellucida, how important it is for it to develop properly. Two hormones are directly involved in making sure that it does just that. FSH and LH from the anterior pituitary are going to go to the ovaries. So let's do that. So now let's take this hormone cascade that we have done and now talk about what happens at the ovaries. What are the end results of this FH, FSH and LH secretion from the AP to the ovaries? So follicle cells will be definitely affected because this is going to be looking at follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. So let's look at what happens to the follicle cells. So let's write that over here. So in days 1 through 13, the follicle cells will have the following sort of process. Their job will be, as a result of this message of FSH and LH reaching them, follicle cells will produce a stradiol. They produce this hormone. It's an estrogen hormone called estradiol, principal sex hormone. What does this stradiol do? Well, what we need to know is that the follicle cells very deliberately and very specifically are going to produce a stradiol at low, slow levels. So what's going to happen is there's going to be a very slow, very gradual rise of estradiol. So I'll say slow rise of estradiol levels. If you take a look at the figure, figure 46.13, what you're going to be noticing is that the estradiol levels at the beginning at the follicular phase are going to be rising very, very slowly. Why is that? Why don't we just have a huge surge of estradiol? Well, that's because, interestingly enough, low levels of estradiol, so low levels, relatively low, slow rising level of estradiol, actually inhibit. They specifically inhibit further FSH and also plus LH, so they inhibit FSH and LH secretion from the AP, from the anterior pituitary. Now, why do we want to stop secretion of FSH and LH? Well, that's because we are trying to prepare for a pregnancy, essentially. All of this is done as a preparation technique. 
What we want to do is make sure that estradiol is arising slowly and at a low level because we don't want more FSH and LH. We want to prepare the follicle as best as we can, and we cannot prepare it as best as we can if we continuously have so much FSH and LH. We only need a certain amount. We only need the go-ahead. Once we have the go-ahead from the anterior pituitary, we want to tell the anterior pituitary, okay, you don't have to give us any more messages of FSH and LH. And this is how we do it. We deliberately have a low level of estradiol being produced by the follicle cells as a result of the FSH and LH that reaches them. Now, what's going to be happening, interestingly enough, is we're going to take this idea and actually throw it upside down. Because what's going to happen is that the growing follicle, as it's developing because of the FSH and LH, the growing follicle, throughout its development, when it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it secretes, as a result, more and more increasing amount of estradiol. So this is weird. We initially, in days, let's say, one through three, four, maybe the early days, five, six, we're producing estradiol at a very low level. But then we're going to start producing estradiol more and more and more as the follicle is growing. This is going to cause, obviously, an increase in estradiol. And usually it's going to be a pretty drastic increase because we're it, we're uh, sort of cumulatively building up the estradiol levels. This is going to directly then talk and tell the hypothalamus to increase GnRH. It's a direct consequence of a lot of estradiol flowing through the blood. That tells the hypothalamus to increase GnRH. Then the hypothalamus will then tell the anterior pituitary, because it's increasing GnRH, to increase its LH and FSH. So now, we are doing what we were trying not to do initially. Why is that? Well, initially we we're trying to just prepare, but now we've prepared long enough, we've grown enough, we want lots and lots of LH and FSH. How are we going to do that? We're going to have this high amount of estradiol that has built up for a long time, causing GnRH to build up. That's going to cause LH, LH and FSH to get to very high levels. Now, remember, LH and FSH have to go to the ovaries. The ovaries will notice that the high levels of LH and FSH are accumulating. So what we notice is that after this, after this uh, increase of estradiol, we get very high LH plus FSH, luteinizing hormone plus follicle-stimulating hormone levels. This must have a consequence at the ovary level. It, the consequence is something known as the LH surge. And this is a very easily noticeable, very easily depicted in the figure that we've mentioned before, figure 46.13. There we notice that there is a huge sort of spike in LH levels that's happening as specifically at day 13. Notice at the end of this cycle is day 13. That's the goal of this cycle. That's the goal of this phase, I should say. A follicular phase is to induce and produce the LH surge because the LH surge then is going to be the specific trigger that causes a very important moment for the secondary oocyte that's within this developing fo follicle. It triggers ovulation at what day? It's always at day 14. So that's basically our ovulation phase happening. Why is it happening? It's because the LH surge happened. Why did the LH surge happen? Because of these following downstream effects that we had covered prior because of this initial uh, LH and FSH release from the anterior pituitary that resulted in a high amount of it, which then resulted in a high amount of LH surging, causing ovulation at day 14. Finally, what we want to mention here is that this is all going to result in a large sort of uh, all-encompassing event known as follicle maturation. That's our goal of the follicular phase. Besides triggering ovulation through the LH surge, we also want to make sure that the follicle is growing successfully and maturing successfully. And this is because as the follicle enlarges, it's enlarging through the LH and FSH messages it's getting, it's also going to be moving towards the ovary surface. Why is it moving towards the surface of the ovary? This is because we need to make sure that the follicle, with its follicle cells that have those proteolytic enzymes, are able to break through the ovary surface and have the secondary oocyte that's mature and ready to be released and ejected enter the oviduct. And that's exactly what happens. What we notice is that after follicle maturation, we immediately get ovulation. That's going to be specifically one day after the LH surge. 
And that's a very deliberate LH surge that happens to cause a very deliberate ovulation event because of this building up and moving towards the ovary surface that the follicle was undergoing. This is why it's called the follicular phase. It's all about making sure that the follicle does its job correctly and reaches the correct place in hopes of having a secondary oocyte which is a part of the follicle being ejected and it's being ejected into the oviduct. And that's basically the end of our follicular phase of the ovarian cycle. Days 1 through 13, the majority of it is devoted to this section of the flowchart. And then finally at the end, we get this ejection of the secondary oocyte. We've got an ovulation. So that's basically, this is our ovulation phase right over here. And now we have to look at the next part of the ovarian cycle. The follicular phase is done, ovulation phase is done. Now it's talking about the luteal phase. What did we leave over and why did we leave it over? What does the follicle eventually turn into.